This is the Greg Bedard Patriots Podcast with Nick Cavins. He's Greg, I'm Nick. Of course, this is the Greg Bedard Patriots Podcast with Nick Cattles. This episode brought to you by Prize Picks, largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. Download the app today. Use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Also, take the guesswork out of buying NBA tickets. Celtics at the Garden tonight. Uh, you can do that with Game Time. Download the Game Time app. Create an account. Use code CLNS for 20 bucks off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, before we get to the Patriots, Greg is ready to let it rip on the Bruins. Game two last night down in Florida. Not a great showing, Greg. Yeah, no, I mean, I wouldn't say I'm um, ready to let it rip. I, I just, I just sort of like wanted to have a discussion about the Bruins because I, you know, I basketball is more your thing, hockey is more my thing. I, yeah. I only have so much bandwidth during the winter months, as, you know, with uh, football season wrapping up and my kids in, involved, and we're a hockey family because my son plays hockey, and I don't know. I've always gravitated towards. Um, the the Bruins a little bit more than the Celtics but um, you know just I, I thought it would be fun exercise to get out of football for a second and you know talk a little Bruins but I, I would say you know my big takeaway is I, I thought that last night game two um, I thought they came out well I thought yep. they sort of built on what they did in game one but you could tell like they ran out of gas and that you know that the the way they were playing, the way they finished off the Maple Leafs, like, you know, they finally, after game five and game six, finally, probably towards the second half of game seven, they finally started to play well. They rolled into that game one. And I was telling, I was even telling my family, I said, never, never read too much into a game one when another team's been off for too long. And I, like, even game one, I didn't think the, I didn't think that the Bruins and you look at the advanced analytics, I didn't think that they dominated that game. Like they certainly had stretches where they did. I did not think the score five to one was indicative of the game. I thought that Jeremy Swayman played out of his rear end again, or else things could have flipped very easily in that game and the Bruins could have lost. And then, you know, you go to game two and I do think that they were going on adrenaline. Um, you know, the Brandon Carlo, dad strength thing in game one I think all of that stuff fizzled which which happens in these series um but again I thought I thought it could it was six to one at the end of the day I thought it could have been a lot worse again Jeremy Swayman I thought was outstanding for most of the game I mean just the the defensive breakdowns that are going on in this team and you this is this was your worry playing the Panthers and how strong they are in the four check and they're relentless and the Bruins certainly matched that in game one with hits and and all that stuff. But I, I thought that um, I thought that the, you know, from basically about six or seven minutes left in the first period through the end of the game, the Panthers just completely pants the Bruins. They were all over the Bruins. They didn't know what to do. The Olmark thing. I, I liked putting him in, give him some action, give Swayman a rest. I think it was, I didn't listen to Monty after the game, but that conversation they had with Swayman going off the ice, I assume it was, Look, you're good. You are outstanding. This is more about us. We're playing like ass on the back end, and you don't need to be exposed to any of this stuff anymore. Let's give Linus a chance to, to, to wet his beak a little bit in case we need him at some point. Um, but I'm not. I wasn't overly enthused with Game One. I'm not overly uh, despondent about Game Two. But you know, you do worry about the tide sort of turning here because this is Game Two. The Panthers definitely had their mojo back. And they were firing on all cylinders, and that's that. That is certainly a worry. I look at the issues that have been issues for a lot of this season, frankly, especially when you look at Hampus Lindholm. But defensively, you mentioned it—the breakdowns. Their defense is shook, Greg. I mean, when when we're sitting here and we're getting ready for Game Three of the second round of the Stanley Cup playoffs, and Mason Lowry is your best defenseman, that's a problem. I mean, it's great for yep. Lowry, and he's showing up at 23 years old, and good for him. But that's not the plan. The plan is that your spine, in essence, is your defensive pairings. And you can't trust McAvoy. He's completely lost. He's not doing anything well. He's screening his own goaltender. He, he's not strong enough in front of the net. He's not strong enough along the boards. He's a little iffy and sketchy with the puck. His decision-making has not been great. 
his time awareness has not been good late in periods, what he's doing, what he's trying to accomplish. Lindholm, as we know, he's not a physical guy. He, he plays that soft style as a defenseman, uh, but, but he's been a human turnover. He hasn't been great. Carlo, ass over tea kettle game seven against Toronto. Fortunately, that did not cost you the game. Last night, he loses a puck battle behind the net, which leads to a goal. Uh, you just brought back Forbort. How healthy is he? He had to leave early in the first period, then came back. Spoon is kind of hot and cold at times. Grizzly, you can't trust him in the playoffs. He's a disaster, was a disaster against Toronto when he was thrown in there, and I think it was game five. So, I mean, the defense is supposed to be the core of this team. You knew they weren't going to score a bunch of goals, and defensively, they're a mess. And the one thing that, that really jumps out at me is as soon as they get the puck on the stick, they're trying to get rid of the puck. And that's okay if you're making crisp passes, you're going tape to tape, you're moving up into the offensive zone, and you're doing something. But it's more of a case of, I got to get rid of the puck. I got to get rid of the puck. And they're, they're, they're doing these little lollipop you know, passes up the, up the ice. They're trying to go off the boards, and, and they're not getting it you know, through the zone, into the neutral zone. They, they just look timid. They look shaky. At times, McAvoy looks like he's got the yips. That's going to change. They will have no chance in this series unless their defensemen show up. And it begins tomorrow night in front of that garden crowd. It's going to be raucous. It's going to be chaotic. They have to embrace that. They need McAvoy to wake up. I don't have much hope in Lindholm right now because he hasn't been good all year. But McAvoy, in the very least, he needs to wake his ass up. And if he doesn't, you mentioned it, the four check. You know, you look at Florida, most hits in the NHL this year. They are the most physical team in the league, and they're going to bring that. And the Bruins are physical. The, Bu the Bruins had the third most hits in the NHL this year. And Toronto versus the Bees in the first round, the most hits in any round so far in the playoffs, right, through that first round of the playoffs. So it's not like the Bruins can't be physical, but, man, they, they've got to be much sharper, and their defense has to be better. That's – it's just it, – it hasn't been good enough. Yep. The other part, too, quickly, is the, the, the undisciplined nature. I know Brazo's a rookie. You can't get baited by Kachuk. Kachuk pisses me off. You know, he's chirping at the end of the game. Congratulations, you won a home game, Matthew. Good job. But, like, Brazo, 20 seconds into the game, you can't rip the dude's helmet off and get sent. You just, you just can't get sent to the box 20 seconds into a playoff game. Like, you can't get – and too many men on the ice. What? <laughs> That's like the fifth time. Can, can yep. we stop with the too many men on the ice? Can somebody get the message? It, that, that's that's amateur hockey stuff. Too many men. Too, it, I saw a tweet last night. Bruins have more too many men on the ice penalties than the rest of the NHL in this playoffs. Well, like, yes, what they are do. We, what the hell are we doing? All right, let's get to football. Um, rookie Manny Camp schedule. Guys are in town today. Uh, this starts tomorrow. Gerard Mayo will speak at quarter of 11 in the morning. They'll have a practice from 11 to 11.30. Media is then at noon. Uh, just overall. Right. Big picture, Greg. What is the point of rookie minicamp? Not much. It's just um, it's basically orientation for for the rookies. And that's certainly important. But as far as I'm sure Patriots fans are out there like chomping at the bit like, yeah, how does uh, Javon Baker look like? Does he have a connection with Drake May? Like, um, you know, I, I was talking to um, a former NFL offensive coordinator today and and I was mentioned about the rookie camp and you know a, a couple of things that he said he's like I'm surprised they even open this up to you guys like it's just really it's about um you know getting the guys out there uh, I will say one of the advantages that the Patriots have and they're going with sort of the uh Packer method of doing things in this area along with many others that we've talked about in the past um I, I want to say they've signed um, 20, 20 to 25, and I'm sure we don't even know all the names, um, not only undrafted free agents, but tryout guys. That's not – the Patriots, in my recollection, and this could be wrong, but I first of all, Belichick didn't often open up rookie camp to us uh, because, you know, he doesn't want us out there judging these guys when it's really or, – it's like college orientation. You know, right. you're just seeing where to go. Where am I staying? You get, you know, a taste of the playbook. Like, you know, nobody's 
nobody's making any judgments off anybody. And I'm sure that some in the media will be making some sort of judgments. And th that's something that I will not be doing. I'm just, I'm generally looking at these guys just to say, just to see what they look like in shirts and shorts. Um, you know, how they do some of the basic things. Uh, I do remember, I remember rookie minicamp when Sony Michelle was drafted. And I do remember coming away from that thinking, uh, that's all there is. Doesn't really strike me as a first round running back type. And that's sort of held for the rest of his career. Now, the, just those sort of snapshots, you're just looking to see, like, does the guy pop, especially the higher draft picks? You're right. like, all right, does this guy pop? A first round running back should pop. Um, Sony Michelle did not. Uh, but, you know, back to the Packer thing. So they've signed so many undrafted free agents and they have tryout guys. I don't remember the Patriots going uh doing very many tryout guys certainly they would have a couple every year but the packers bring in a lot of guys they would bring in a lot of guys from area colleges and so you get upwards of and you also have some guys back from last year that maybe weren't here um uh exclusive rights free agents uh that sort of thing so i would expect them to have anywhere from 30 to 45 guys on the field that's a healthy amount yeah. Like a lot of times when you don't do that, you only have like two receivers and you're worried about them popping a hamstring. And and one thing this coach said to me is like, remember, almost all of these guys are going to be in terrible shape because they haven't from, you know, once the combine, all that stuff was sort of over, they stopped that training. And so you just don't want anybody to get hurt. You just want to get their feet wet. I don't, I know fans are going to be excited because football is going to be on the field. Footballs will be flying. People will be in Patriots practice jerseys, including Drake May, the third overall pick, and people are going to be excited. But I, I would just temper expectations about like what we're really going to learn from this. Um, you know, not a whole hell of a lot. Again, this is this is orientation for these guys. Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with more than three million members. It is the easiest and most exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick more or less in two or more player stats and watch the winnings roll in. Get in on the playoff action and win up to 100 times your money on prize picks as you and the world's best players take the game to a new level during basketball and hockey's postseason, which is coming up. I can't wait. I know Nick is going to be freaking <laughs> geeked up for all that stuff. That's for sure. You can now win up to 100 times your money on prize picks with as little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into a thousand with basketball, hockey, baseball entries today on Prize Pick, America's number one fantasy sports app. This week on Prize Picks, I'm selecting Jalen Brown for more than 25 points, David Pasternak for two goals or more, Tyler O'Neill, the big thumper, for two plus home runs this week, and Kenley Jansen for two saves. Download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. That's CLNS for a first deposit match up to a hundred bucks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy at Prize Picks. Moving on from the rookie minicamp, Greg. Let's get into this uh, search. I'm just going to call it a search because some have called it a GM search. It's not really a GM search. It's not even really a search. Maybe <laughs> it is what it is. But here's the latest uh, from Bedard buddy Bert Breer. Lots of bees. Uh, the title. <laughs> We know the title. It, it has been registered with the NFL. EVP, Executive Vice President of Player Personnel. And Bert then followed that up with another tweet. I don't know how many people saw this one, but this was the more important one. Mayo and Wolf will both report to ownership. And specifically this role, the EVP of Player Personnel, will have final say on the 53-man roster and will have oversight of the cap, analytics, et cetera. First, just your thoughts, Greg, on Burt's reporting yesterday. Yeah, this is where I thought it was going to end up um, all along. The the, pay, uh, the the crafts, for whatever reason, don't do the general manager thing. They like to, um, you know, Belichick might have not liked his titles. The crafts like their titles with, you know, Robin Glazer, executive vice president of football business and assistant to the head coach, intergalactic domination uh, coordinator, um, you know, her titles. So it's nice that 
the person who's actually in charge of picking the players, so we are led to believe, will actually have a title that's at least on the same level as Robin Glazer. So, um, you know, that's nice. I, I always thought it was going to end up here. Um, I think the Patriots needed to get back to this. They need they need somebody in charge of personnel, and I like how they're, they're divvying it up. Um, you know, some might make fun of this a little bit. I think we've we there there have been other organizations, I forget who it was, maybe the Eagles or the Chiefs, but they called it like a triangulation of power um sort of thing. <laughs> so like ownership, head coach, uh director of player personnel, that sort of thing. Um but I, I, I think it's I think it's good. I will just be interested to see if they they allow people to do their role or things, you know, bleed into each other. Like how much one of my overarching fears for this team is that Mayo with his relationship with Robert Kraft is going to be able to curry favor with ownership and delve into personnel. Like yeah. I really like this guy, but Elliot doesn't like, that's one of my big fears. I've seen it happen to other organizations. I just hope the Patriots aren't a clown show like that. I'm so glad you brought that up. Uh, I did my podcast earlier today and one of the things that jumped out at me was Burt's reporting that both Mayo and the new EVP will report to ownership. Now, I'm not going to sit here and be naive. Of course, coaches speak to owners. Of course, there are those conversations. But I would like more specifics regarding that. Like, is Mayo talking to ownership about things that are under the coaching umbrella? Or is he going to, and you just mentioned it, Greg, go to ownership and be like, oh, man. You know, I love Elliot, but Javon Baker just doesn't get it. He just, he's just, he's just doesn't get it. We now, now we don't have a, a guy who can play the X, who can actually, you know, make plays. Down. If, if that's the case, that could cause some major issues. So I, I would love more specifics regarding Mayo's relationship to ownership and what the reporting has to do on his side. I, I'd like to know that because I have some of the same concerns you have. Yeah, I mean, especially, Nick, you know, when it comes down to, you know, the 53, and that surprises me a little. I, You know, normally it's they're in charge of, like, the offseason, but really the coach is in charge of the, the final 53 and things like that. But, like, you know, for example, you could see friction if Elliot Wolf wants to keep two more offensive players and, you know, Gerard Mayo, who's a defensive head coach, he gets less players and like, you know, maybe there was this guy, some linebacker that, that Mayo really liked that, you know, this is our type of guy. We need to keep him. But at the end of the day, Wolf says, no, we got to err on the side of keeping more guys on offense because we, you know, we, we have a lot to rebuild there. We need to keep more guys. Does that sort of thing cause friction? All right. A couple of guys we found out have interviewed for the job. Let's start with the director of scouting for the Eagles, Brandon Hunt. Any thoughts on him? So, yeah, Hunt um, is a guy who, you know, really came up. He's a scout. He came up through the scout, um, interned with the Steelers, was a scout with the Texans, went back, was with the Steelers another 13 years. Uh, you know, it was interesting. You know, Kevin Colbert, their longtime general manager, retired, and Omar Khan yeah. uh, was selected to replace Colbert and – I don't know if Hunt thought he should have gotten the job, but then all of a sudden he ended up at the at the Eagles. Um, you know, Hunt is, and again, we talked about this before. I mean, he's a minority candidate. He's black. Um, and so the Patriots have to interview two outside minority candidates. Um, there's always been sort of a close relationship between the, at least the football side of the Patriots and the Eagles. Is this Howie doing um, – a favor. Uh, he hasn't been, Hunt hasn't been there very long, but you know, look, certainly he has the experience coming from the Steelers side. That's a, that's a great organization. I do wonder if these interviews are more um, to possibly fill out the staff long-term than actually like, you know, being up for the quote unquote job. You know, I, I had the same reaction. I talked about this during my solo pod this week, the, the idea that, Yes, you have to satisfy the Rooney rule, but if if you are bringing these guys in, 
it also stands to reason, much like the coaching staff, you bring guys in and then, hey, you might not be the defensive coordinator, but we can slide you to here, right? That happened last year with Adrian Clem when Belichick was talking to him about the OC. Obviously, he got the O-line coaching job. So you look at Brandon Hunt, and he's kind of the scouting part of this, right? Which leads me to Samir Suleiman, who is the former Panthers director of player negotiation. He currently does not have a job. The, the, the turnover in Carolina, so he's a free agent, so to speak. And Suleiman, he has really only dedicated himself to negotiations, player contracts, all that stuff. Like, that's that's what he does. That's his wheelhouse. So I'm looking at that, Greg, and, and I feel even stronger about the idea of, well, maybe these guys, maybe Hunt and Suleiman could actually still be a part of this front office but not given the top job. Maybe Suleiman comes in as the contract negotiator cap specialist, and you have Hunt be kind of your top guy in the scouting department or one of the top guys in the scouting department under Wolf. Would that make sense to you? Yeah, 100%. I, I think, and we've talked about this in the past, uh, one, of my, one of my big um, critiques of, at least Bill Belichick, the end of Bill Belichick is that um, I thought that they were not proactive like other teams at um, figuring out doing cap tricks, you know, basically to maximize the cap. They stopped doing that. Um, their negotiations were notoriously rough. Um, I, I thought they left a lot on the table as far as moving money around and things like that. And I, so, you know, getting a, uh, a real cap person, sort of like a lawyer always did it for the Patriots. Um, getting a real cap person in here who's been in the middle of it, to me, would be would be another weapon for them to use to modernize the, the, the football side of the New England Patriots, which I think was needed. And I will say that, you know, you know, Suleiman, he, you know, he really made his bones with the with the Carolina Panthers. Of course, we know about, you know, Dave Tepper coming in as owners. You know, one of the guys, and I'm sure part of the reason that he's here, a guy that we've talked about in the past, Pat Stewart, who grew up with the Patriots, but then went to the Eagles and also, but ended up was with the Panthers for a while. And he's, he, Pat Stewart's been back for a year or two. Um, you know, I'm sure that Pat Stewart is a guy who pointed out, like, you need to talk to this guy. Like, he's really good. He got, he got in a crappy situation in Carolina, but he is extremely sharp. He's really good, hardworking, all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, you know, could I see both these guys, Hunt and Suleiman, ending up with the Patriots um, in short order? Uh, probably at least one of them. I say Suleiman has the strongest odds. We'll see about Hunt and how things shake out with the rest of the staff as far as who's retained and stuff like that. But, yeah, I would say there's, there's a good chance of that. The Pat Stewart link is a very smart link as well that you just made. And, we also should point out that Hunt and Suleiman worked together for a long time in Pittsburgh. So I, I would imagine they yep. know each other and they know each other pretty well. So if you're bringing in outside people, you have Suleiman who knows Stewart. You have Suleiman who knows Hunt. They work together for a long time. A little bit easier to bring those guys in from the outside than some randos. So uh, I, I think that's absolutely something we should look at. The Celtics have vanquished the Heat and are now on to the Eastern Conference semifinals where they will have home court advantage again. Who wouldn't want to be at TD Garden to soak in the great atmosphere there? Well, Game Time is an authorized ticket marketplace of the NBA, which makes getting playoff tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to the tip off. Killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat and the lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying NBA tickets, and it's super easy. I love the seat view component, Nick. I don't know how you feel about it. I will not buy tickets to any sporting event unless I can get a view on where the seats are going to be. Love maybe, it. Uh, maybe I have a little Fenway fatigue, but on the app, it says right in there, when you're about to buy those seats, they give you a panoramic view of the seats. I love that component of it. Take the guesswork out of buying NBA tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app and create an account and use code CLNS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem the code CLNS for $20 off. 
Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, let's continue to talk about this uh, this search because I don't know if you love title talk, but we're going to get into some title talk because some people are really wrapped up into the title talk. Now, me personally, I am writing a column for Greg tomorrow, BSJ, on this title talk, on you know what is actually the meaning of a title and certain things that I've I've witnessed over the past couple of weeks and, and certain things that have been said. But let's get to Diana Rossini because she, going back a few weeks ago, said that Jonathan Kraft was heavily involved. Then she followed that up with an article in The Athletic where she kind of took a step back from that and more painted it as Jonathan Kraft was playing the usual role that ownership would play, which is, hey, you know, something big happens, if a trade's going to happen, I want to be looped in. To me, there's a, di- there's a difference, Greg, and I just want your thoughts on this first. Is there a difference to you from being heavily involved and being looped in? Because to me, there is. Uh, yeah, for sure. I would think that you know, heavily involved means like you're almost there on a daily basis trying to figure out what, what's going on and also like weighing in. Okay, good. We agree on that. So Diana yesterday, she tweeted out that here's the gist. I'm going to give you the gist of it. If you don't want speculation as far as ownership being involved in all of that, don't mess with titles. And her point was, why don't you just name somebody a general manager? Because that's pretty much what every other team does in the league. Aside, by the way, from Cincinnati, who doesn't do that. But uh, don't mess with titles if you if you don't want speculation. Do you agree with that, Greg? 100%. And uh, I, I feel... I feel Diana's frustration um, and pain because um, let's just say I've, I've received my own feedback. Um, you know, there's a definitely an effort to push back on any talk that Jonathan Kraft is heavily involved in football operations. And, you know, you just kind of throw up your hands and you like, you know, and you're just like, well, what do you want from us when you don't, when you don't give people titles, when you don't interview people, when you do like all this stuff, like what are we supposed to take away from all that's going on? And so, uh, yeah, I definitely understand where she's coming from. Okay. So from her point of view, now that you explained it that way, frustration, if she's just voicing her frustration, then okay, that that's fine. I don't understand the fascination with the general manager title. I, I, I don't understand it. I, I know that's right. what all these other teams do. To me, the more important thing is, is that they're creating a title in the first place. Whether you like the title or not, they're creating a title. So to go beyond that, again, Bert had the details. So we not only have the title of the role, but Bert tweeted out what the responsibilities of that role are going to be. So outside of not picking the title that a specific person might want, I don't know what's so wrong with with the the title business here. Bill Belichick was here for almost a quarter of a century, and guess what? He never had a title, folks. He was the head coach. So if the premise, if the premise is, well, unless you name a general manager, we're always going to wonder if the owners are meddling, if they're involved heavily or not. Well, A, Belichick never had a title, and no one ever thought the Crafts were involved. No one talked about them meddling in his business. Um, B, owners are always going to be a part of this. Like, that's what I don't understand. It, unless you think that Jonathan Kraft was sitting there going, yeah, Elliot, uh, Caden Wallace, 68. Make the pick. Like, what are we right. doing? Of course they had a conversation about number three. Of course, like, Ownership gets brought in to big decisions in all 32 NFL cities. That's how it works. If you're going to pay a quarterback $150 million, guess who you're talking to? Like, when I was a program director in Sacramento, I had autonomy, okay? I had for about eight months. Long story. Don't need to go down that road. But for the for the first eight months or so, I had I had autonomy. So we had three positions to hire. I made the final call on those decisions. But guess what? There was a market manager in our building. Market manager is pretty much ownership for this analogy. 
I had to update the market manager on hiring a co-host for the afternoon show. I had to go to him and say, this is the negotiation. This is what we're going to offer. Here was his counter. This is what I'm thinking. Relocation money. Blah. You're going to loop the top person in. Greg runs BSJ. I can guarantee you before John Corrales puts some kind of big column or big idea up or whatever, he's going to pass it by Greg if there's any controversy like that. That's how this works. So I, I just don't really understand fundamentally what the big issue is here with the Patriots. Oh, they didn't use general manager, so there's got to be something shady afoot. I, yeah, I, don't know, I just man. I, I get that I get that point of view, but from you know being in it and um, probably having a similar experience to Diana, I think all I could say is like I think I think she's getting chirped by certain people. And <laughs> and probably has heard it more than a few times considering her strong reporting. And let me also point out that like when you talk to people around the league, um, and I think Giardi's writing a column on this um, for tomorrow. I may post it today. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to have time. Or it'll be our first thing tomorrow, sort of his NFL notebook, and it's going to look at this search. And uh, I haven't read it yet, but from from what I understand, because Giardi did run some some things by me, as you said. Um, you know, there are a lot of people, a lot of executives around the league who don't like Jonathan Kraft. Um, they think that he's heavily involved that, you know, in all that stuff. And I think that Diana has has relayed some of that stuff and she's getting a lot of pushback from people that you would expect with the Patriots. And I think she's just frustrated with like, do you know what do you, what do you want from me? Like you're, you're not laying anything out directly until now, until, you know, Burt's report. So they finally, maybe in response to Rossini, finally laid out what they're doing because they didn't talk about it and wouldn't be clear about it for, for months. And they do it ass backwards where they don't do the interviews in January and just hire Elliot Wolf after interviewing people once you fire Bill Belichick. And so I think there's just like, there's just frustration. I think to me, I read that as her bubbling over, like hearing it from enough people being like, all right, fine. I get it. But like, if you don't want this, you don't want this criticism. You don't want this stuff out there. How about you be clear and lay out your plan? Like as soon as you fire Bill Belichick. So here's, here's a couple things. And this is a, this is one of those things where I wish you and I were doing a radio show for three or four hours, because I think we could get a lot of meat off this bone, but mm -hmm. here's what I would say. And I tweeted this last night. I understand the frustration now that you explain it from a writer's point of view. I get it. And if that's what she's saying, I understand the frustration. Okay. But if I'm the Patriots, and I don't want to sit here, I got my Patriots hat on literally right now. But I don't want to sit here and be like the, you know, the Bobo and, and, and defend them at every stop. But number one, if I'm the Patriots, I go, wait a minute. Just, just wait a minute. From day one, Robert Kraft told you ownership's not going to be involved. He was asked about it. He answered it directly and said, we're not getting involved. Every time Gerard Mayo has been asked, he has said they're not involved. Elliot Wolf has said multiple times to the media, I am making the final call. I am making the final decision. There have been reports, I believe, from you, from Burt, from Gasper, from Curran, from Perry, from Reese, saying Elliot Wolf's making the final call. So... I'm just, I don't know, aside from. Yeah, but without the, yeah, but without the title, like, I mean, yeah, without know, like, he's, but we know why that is right. Like we, we know, look, I'm not, I'm not sitting here and arguing the process. You and I agree that the process to, to get to this point has been messy, but they've also, to me, they've said it point blank. We're not involved. It's Elliot's job. So. Whether they yeah, but they invite this because they didn't do the process. This is it's all about the process because they didn't do the process right. If they just would have interviewed these two guys on January twelfth or whatever, and then named Elliot Wolf vice president of player personnel, nobody would be nobody would be having these. I mean, there would be some certainly from certain sports talk radio hosts, but <laughs> there wouldn't be this. I think like league wide criticism of. Jonathan Kraft and questioning his involvement. They invited this when they decided to go this route, no matter what right. they're flapping their gums about. It, they could have made it easier on themselves for sure. But 
again, I think they've been as transparent as they can be when they've been asked these questions. And to me, they've been clear about who the guy is running the operation. I, I think like we, we've we've been upset about their messaging at times during this offseason. If there's one bit of the messaging they've been clear about, it has been Elliot Wolf. And and you go back to what Robert Kraft said. And he had mentioned we are going to appoint somebody now. Should they have given him the title beforehand? What? Yeah, it, again, it's been messy. But if you go off of what Kraft said at that introductory press conference with Gerard Mayo, he said, we're going to appoint somebody before the big decisions are made. You will know who that person is. And we will also talk to outside people. So that's exactly what happened. They appointed Wolf. Wolf, by all reporting that we know of, ran free agency ran the draft, and now they're looking at external candidates. So I understand that it was it was a messy process and they could have done a better job of it, and that would have alleviated a lot of headaches, especially for the media. But my point of view, just looking at this, is they've said what they were, you know, they've done what they said they were going to do, even though I don't necessarily agree with the layering of it or the prioritizing of it. They've done what they said they were going to do. And so... This this Jonathan Kraft thing, which is the next part I want to get to, look, it, it's rather obvious. I don't know Jonathan from a hole in the wall. No clue. By the way, he's on the TKO board. I love the WWE, Jonathan. If you're listening, I'd love to get a job in the WWE at some point in my life. I, I, I don't know, like, I, I don't know him from a hole in the wall. From what I gather, and you and and you know him somewhat, and you you talk to people more than I do, so maybe you can confirm this or deny it. It seems to me watching him like during the dynasty and stuff and picking up things that you've said and what I've read, he could be a little bombastic and he could, Mm -hmm. some people might not love his approach with certain things. Yeah, I would say that um, I think he's, he's very smart. He's very good at what he does. Um, I do think he's chilled out a little bit over the years, Um, but he is, um, I wouldn't say that he has great interpersonal skills and um you know certainly in a business setting he does but as far as you know the football side of things um i think that he rubs uh, a lot of people the wrong way in the league in football and that's part of the issue for him all right so this is what i want to ask you as a journalist and i think people that listen and watch us will be very interested in this in your process when you're writing something The thing that sticks out to me, like the Wickersham article, and it was also, I think, Jeremy Fowler and Van Nata who helped them with that, if I remember correctly. Yep. Those three guys came out with that long piece. This this entire Jonathan Kraft, Wizard of Oz narrative that is never going to be disproved unless we have surveillance and wiretaps and contracts written in blood for people. You can never disprove it. This entire Wizard uh, Wizard of Oz idea stems from that article. So my question to you as a journalist, you just told me, Jonathan rubs people the wrong way. Not everybody, mm-hmm. but but people. He's not really well-loved within the league. To me, when I read something like, and let's be honest, those three reporters are great at what they do for ESPN, but that specific piece of the article was pure speculation from people in the building. It was not confirming something and saying this is what's happening it was people in the building are thinking that if Belichick is gone Kraft and Glazer want to take over the football ops that's the gist of it so what I have to ask you is as a reporter Greg when you're writing something like that story and you get somebody or a couple of people telling you yeah well we think you know Kraft and Glazer we think they 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 want they want the football ops. How much do you weigh the person that's talking to you their their personal feelings about who they're telling you about? You know what I mean? Like it, yeah, yeah. So if that somebody doesn't like Jonathan Kraft or you know he rubs people the wrong way, could some of this stuff just be people who don't like him, who are you know paranoid about him wanting power, throwing it out there? That that's what I wonder. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly I can only speak from, you know, 
the way I do things. I, um, and, and, you know, sometimes I get, basically when I get information like that, I don't feature it prominently. Maybe I'm, maybe I mention on a podcast or something like that about how, like, you know, uh, there are some people in the building who think that Jonathan Kraft is running things. I just make sure to, you know, just be like, well, some people think that other yeah. people don't, um, you know, so you just giving, all right, some people think this, but there's another side of the coin, to this thing, but that's certainly anything. You, anytime you write something, um, you try to look at the biases, your history with the source. And, you know, and I will say that especially a lot of young journalists, um, you know, that haven't, um, you know, don't have a ton of experience or haven't, you know, gone through different things and, and, you know, come up a certain way in this business. I think a lot of them like just, um, take the most salacious quote. Um, you know, so a lot of times it's one source, you get this in a lot of the, you know, below the newspaper, sort of like the blogs and things like that. They'll get one person that tells them that and they'll be like source, blah, blah, blah. Like, no, one source doesn't mean anything. And uh, so, yeah, you definitely have to think about all that stuff. I think it's interesting because it's very similar to what you came out with. And at the time, you got a little bit of heat, and there was pushback on it about Gerard Mayo rubbing some people in the building wrong. And one of the questions I believe I asked you at the time was, you, you can't tell me who is – saying this to you, obviously, because that's how this works. Scouts and, and execs and sources and people in the building, and they want anonymity if they're going to give you some dirt, just how it worked. But it's very similar where, like, it, I looked at that story, and I, and I wondered, and you and I are friends. I, I never ask you anything about that stuff, ever. I, I will never, ever ask you, hey, who told you this? Like, I, I won't even mm -hmm. try to dig. It's 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 that's it, just not what what I do or what anybody should do. But I got to tell you, I, I do. I did wonder. And I think I asked you at the time, like I did want. Or, OK, is this is this Joe Judge saying this about Gerard Mayo? Is this Bill O'Brien saying it about Mayo? Because the one thing we always got to remember, sources leak information for a lot of reasons. And mm -hmm. at least some of the reasons, some of the time is their own agenda. So I, I just. The way I look at it is when you have all of this reporting that says Elliot Wolf is making the decisions, making the final calls, versus the one report from ESPN where it was really speculation from a couple of people in the building, I'm going to take the vast majority of the reporting who are telling us that Jonathan Kraft is not scouring scouting reports. He's not running football ops. So that's just what I would say. All right, I, I want to continue well, this. I mean, I, I'll just say I'll just say this to – sort of have the last word on this um you know and, and i've reported i would say my reporting on this subject has been more towards espn now i don't think that jonathan is um you know hugely involved in football operations but i definitely think that he is involved and i think that robin glazer is his eyes and ears in the 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 organization and um but i you know i don't know if i necessarily have a problem with that. And, um, you know, I'm more worried about, uh, the coaching staff and, and things like that and how they come together. And, you know, it's like, and my reporting on Mayo, which I a hundred percent stand behind. And I think we ended up talking about it. I mean, I forget the exact number, but at least, at least five to seven people, different people in the organization told me that stuff. Nobody else. The only person who has come out against that is Mayo himself i've not heard from one other subject around the patriots that has said greg you know you got that wrong it because it's it's 100 percent true the other thing i wanted to make a point about you know the reporting about jonathan and all this stuff if i were you i think you also have to look at the atmosphere that we are in now with the patriots media um how many people are aligned with the coach? How many people are aligned with ownership? Um, I would say, you know, taking things as gospel from multiple people, even though they're on the Patriots beat, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying that this is sort of the honeymoon phase. 
you know, the new coach, the new ownership in charge, like somewhat, you know, now that Bill's removed, um, I would just say, like, I, I think it's a, it's a weird time. And, and I, there's been too much of the same reporting going around and that bothers me. I could understand that. Um, what I would say, though, to push back on that is why should we listen to the one lonely voice? Um, Because there's two sides to that coin, right? Like, to me, I, I trust Mike Reese. I, I think, you know, Tom Curran has had some really, really, really good reporting over the last few months. Of course people can look at that and say, well, Tom's got – the bat phone to ownership. You can, you can read that into it if you'd like. Certainly, Gerard Mayo worked at NBC Sports Boston. He worked with Phil Perry. He worked with Tom. I'm sure people have made those connections. We're not like, you know, ripping the curtain open. You know, look what's behind this. They know they had a work relationship, and they're probably friends with Gerard. And, and, and I think to Curran and Perry's credit, they have brought that up, that we've worked with him. We, we do think he's a friend. Curran's been doing it a long time, and, you know, I, I just – the pushback is another interesting part of it because you can paint that different ways as well. As well, Like, you could look at it and say, well, there's a lot of pushback because the Patriots don't want people to really know what's going on in there. They, they want to make sure that, you know, they're getting the message out there that Kraft's not running football ops. The other side of it could be they're sick of it that they just went through 24 years with, with Bill, and because there's a massive change in the organization, maybe they feel that people are leaping to conclusions. And they, A, want to clear their name of certain things. B, want to make sure that Elliot Wolf is the one that, that is taking the accountability if he is indeed making these football decisions. So... It's very layered. Like I said, if it was a three-hour show, we could go on four-hour show. It's very layered. A lot of it is journalistic stuff. But just big picture, I think there's always reasons why people write what they write. That's how the world yeah. works. So it what, really depends what? on why the pushback is happening. It could certainly be Kraft, you know, just trying to cover up and saying, you know, screw these people. They don't need to know what we're doing. And, you know, this is how we're going to run our business. And – We'll just tell them that Elliot's doing this and that's the way it's going to be. Or it could be, man, I'm sick and tired of hearing at every stop. I hear I hear radio shows screaming and ranting and raving about how Jonathan is running the football operations. We have to go on the attack. We have to push back on that. I would also understand that side of it as well. Yeah. Um, one final point, and let's move on from this. Um, the other possibility is that um, – and you could see how this, whether it's the dynasty or the roast or whatever, um, Robert in his uh, elder stages uh, is very sensitive to what's being said also about his Hall of Fame candidacy and all this stuff. And that if, if Jonathan's being pushed as sort of the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain type of thing, that he's actually running things, and the and the father is hearing about this stuff and you know and his ego and all this stuff is that part of the pushback yeah. that they they know internally how sensitive robert is to all this stuff and they are quick to to squash anything that that might usurp robert's power or or the perception that uh he's not in full command of the new england patriots at this time Certainly a fair point to be made and a, and a reasonable question to ask. And here's the thing. We'll probably never know. But let's keep, yep. with, the, uh, let's keep with the title stuff quickly because I did, I, I did want to look at the other side of this, which is if Wolf is promoted, Greg, what do you think happens to his director of scouting position? Does it get eliminated? Does somebody else move in there? What happens? Uh, I would think if he's in charge of that, um, I think that they will go to a more, and I'm just looking up the Packers, the Packers model. Um, I, I don't really, I'm not too big on titles except, you know, beyond below the, 
you know, cause below the top ones. Like I, I, all I really want is a freaking head coach and offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator, um, you know, it, somebody who's the de facto GM, whatever that title is. Like, you know, I, I you know, I don't really care um, because, you know, you figure that stuff out. But like with the Packers right now, Russ Ball is the executive vice president, director of football operations. You know, is that going to be the Elliott Wolf? And then you have, you know, um, where is what's his name? It's not there. But anyways, uh, oh, player personnel. So Gutekunst is the general manager. Um, you know, they have pro p- player personnel executive, um, director of college scouting. Like, you know, I they'll they'll figure that out. It's just you know what how Elliot wants to align things. I don't think. We'll see what happens with Matt Groh. Um, But I think, you know, you have Pat Stewart involved. You have Alonzo Highsmith involved. Could other Packers people come? It's possible. Could people be on the out here aside from Groh? Could be. But, you know, you also have to look at normally these guys leave, like say Cameron Williams is an up-and-comer in the Patriots organization. You know, it – is he going to get plucked by somebody? Does he have any relationships? You know, would, does he have a relationship with Nick Casario? Normally those guys go with guys who used to be here, who have now risen to power someplace else. But with what's going on with the Patriots, that hasn't happened a whole lot in recent years. So um, we'll have to see how it all shakes out. All right, last question for you about the title thing, and it has to do with Mac Rowe. This might not mean anything. And we've got some BSJ member questions we're going to get to, too, a couple of those. But – Anything to read into that this title is EVP of per- player personnel, executive vice president of player personnel. Meanwhile, Matt Groh holds the director of player personnel title. Um, anything to read into that? Could could Groh be not long for this organization? So say this again. What's the what's the tell? What sort of made no, you no, question? So I was just wondering because it's it. It sounds very similar. You have the executive vice president of player personnel, which oh. is a new title, and Matt Groh is the director of player personnel. Of course, the director could always report to the EVP, but it's pretty close in title, and I wonder if that means, hey, we're just going to move Groh to a different title and, and, and role, or we're going to get rid of that director of player personnel, and we're also going to get rid of the person who's been in that spot. Yeah, I, I just think – um I just think they're going to come up with a whole bunch of new titles. And, and, you know, like I was talking about when with the Packers. um, So we'll see how it all shakes out. But like, I remember one for, for a stretch, um, you know, Elliot Wolf and I, I I think it was Alonzo Highsmith and might've been Reggie McKenzie basically were like, had risen to the point where they were like right below Ted Thompson and Ted basically made them. I think they were both director of player personnel. What the hell does that mean? What is director of <laughs> person? So that's what I mean. Where like these titles are like a bunch of crap, and you know nobody. Yeah, I, I don't know. I got one more question because you brought this up. You were the first guy that brought this up. The primary football executive. So yep. if that is registered to the league, right? And, and so it's executive vice president of player personnel. Let's say Elliot Wolf gets the job. If he is the primary football executive, do we say case closed or can they still run a shadow organization here? Are you talking about in regards to the well, you love this Jonathan Kraft stuff? Don't no, you? no, just so is this a, I'm is wondering this in like, regards so to Jonathan Kraft. My question is the primary football executive, right? Whoever gets named yeah. that. Explain to the people, I think, again, like what? What does that entail? What's that mean within the league? The power of like that person being yeah. in that spot, like you, Belichick was. You have you have to name it uh, because it basically goes to um, and some you some teams name a secondary football executive, and so it basically comes down to like can they be stolen from somebody else? Like okay. you know, can you? It's basically like you know, in compensation and like you know, are, can this team? if a team has a primary uh, football executive opening, but you're only secondary with the Patriots, like you could get interviewed and you could leave uh, without tampering or what have you. It's that's really what it's about. Another question that I have for you about Brandon hunt quickly, because I don't understand. I want to make sure people know how the front office thing works. 
could he just move to New England or would they have to give him – for example, the primary football executive number two position, or would they have to give him a position that is above his current position? Does it is, does it work like a coach where like if you're if you're a linebackers coach, you you got to be like defensive coordinator to take the gig somewhere else, or can he does he have freedom of movement? Well, I think he only has freedom of movement if he's out of contract. Okay, which a lot of guys their contracts end around this time. Um, some guys choose to let it run out. Um, some guys don't. They they want the long term security. And look, some people might get annoyed saying, "Oh, Nick with the details." To me, details are knowledge. They're good to have. All right, this episode we'll get to a couple of member questions. This episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. Download the app today. Use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. And of course, check Greg and company out at BSJ fifty bucks for the year. So, Greg, pick one or two member questions. Let's rock. So I'm definitely not taking this one from Casey Johnson nine which is about Jonathan Kraft, how, how much power he has. Because <laughs> um, I'm about to – I've talked more about Jonathan Kraft in the last half hour than I have, I think, in the last 10 years combined. This one's a good one because uh, I did notice this because Elliot Wolf was on Adam Schefter's podcast. Yeah. Not yeah. Bob asked, can you share some insight on Mike McCarthy's quarterback school method Wolf mentioned on Schefter's podcast? Um, yes, I thought it was interesting that he brought that up. Um you know, Mike McCarthy was, especially at the, uh, around the time that I joined, when I started covering the Packers, the end of far beginning of Rodgers, um, Mike McCarthy was very famous also in, in, um, in New Orleans, and it goes back to New Orleans, uh, for his quarterback school, um, that, you know, that he was able to train these guys up. Now, it's nice for Elliot to bring that up, um, but... And there will be some element of that. But the thing is, like, there's a huge difference now between how much time you can spend with these guys. Like, they used to, it used to be like a springtime thing. And it's, I'm sure it's in OTAs a little bit, but like, you know, McCarthy would have like a full weekend just with like the quarterbacks. And like, you just can't do it anymore. Like, they, you, you are not allowed to have that kind of time with the players. And so, to to really say that's going to happen, um, to me, it's just it's just not realistic. Now, I do think that Elliot bringing up that that Alex Van Pelt trained under Mike McCarthy and Ben McAdoo did, so they've seen how they go through building up quarterbacks. I think is definitely valid. I just think um, it's not it's it's hard to compare what what these coaches are going to be able to do and what Mike McCarthy could do you know, 17 years ago. It's just a completely different NFL. We'll end with this. And I, th Oh, you want to get another one? What'd you say? No, nah, we're, we're good with that. We'll end on that one. That was a good. One. <laughs> well, well, we began with hockey. Let's end with basketball. So Patrick Beverly just got suspended by the NBA for four games for throwing a basketball at a fan, not once, but twice, four games. Slippery four slope. Games. He could, he should. He should get he should get suspended that for being a jackass to that reporter in the locker room. Hey, oh, they are you subscribed to my podcast? I'm gonna start doing that to, to to Patriots fans that come up to me on the street. <laughs> be like, are you subscribed to my podcast? If not, I'm not talking. Subscribe to my <laughs> podcast, Nick Cattle Show. By the way, if you're listening, there you all go. right, there you have it. We're done for the week. It was a long one, my fault, but I think it was good. Thought it was a good conversation. He's Greg. I'm Nick. Back next week. Till then, be well.